I'll 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 get this series started. Um, so I'm uh, my name is Neha, and uh, I, I work at uh, AWS. And essentially, today I'm talking about how we are making verification the new normal for all AWS customers. And to start, we actually extended the definition of verification itself. So we want to enable millions of AWS customers to prove correctness of their systems with respect to their specification. So today, customers can go to the AWS console and use compute, analytics, storage, and database services to build applications, uh, store data, and even run their workloads. And access to all these services and resources in AWS is governed by policies written in a domain-specific language. And customers actually have requirements around who should have access to what. So we go, okay, policies seem like a great verification target. So how do we get the specification? We can't get millions of AWS users to write specifications, though we did try and it didn't go so great. The key insight is we need to infer specifications automatically but do it in a way that is customized to each user themselves. And the first application of this that I'm gonna talk about is block public access. It's a preventative control, and it's verifying whether a policy grants unrestricted public access to untrusted entities. And how do we get this set of untrusted entities? They can be different for different users. Again, we can't expect them to write the list and the set of untrusted entities and provide it, or even go back and annotate all the legacy policies to say what is untrusted. So let's look at an example to dive into what do we mean by untrusted entity. So here, the username admin is an untrusted entity because anybody can create a username admin in their account. But the source VPC, ABCDE, is a trusted entity because its value, it's based on an identifier of your private network, and it's set by the system. So our insight here is that we can automatically infer the trusted entities from the policies themselves. And coming up with a precise definition of what these trusted key value pairs are, actually requires significant domain expertise and knowledge and work. For example, the, uh, the value of this source VPC, if it was a wild card, then it would not be a trusted entity because it's saying allow any source VPC. But even though it requires all this extensive knowledge, it needs to be created once and can be used many times. So once we have these, the next thing we do is we take our policy and turn it into an SMP formula using a tool we have called Zokova. And here, the set of all satisfying assignments uh, in the formula correspond to the set of requests or accesses that are allowed by the policy. So a request is allowed by a policy if it matches one of the allow statements and doesn't match one of the deny statements. And then finally, to evaluate whether the policy does grant unrestricted public access, we check the satisfiability of this formula that says, is it allowed and is it uh, is it part of one of the untrusted uh, entities? So, and you can read more about how we do it in an upcoming FSC paper. But the key here is it is integrated into uh, Amazon S3. And this integration needed to satisfy the operational requirements of S3, security, availability, uh, robustness. The other key here is the computational complexity of the problem makes the pathological cases unavoidable. And to maintain soundness, we choose to fail closed, which means if the analysis returns unknown because the analysis timed out, we say the policy is public. So this is great, right? Like, so how, how do we take it a step further? Uh, and taking the idea of inferring specification to the next level is what we did in Access Analyzer. Here, customers want more granular capabilities, not just public access, but they want to say, does an external entity X have access? 
And we can't, again, expect them to write bespoke specifications. Does Lee have access? Does Nathan have access? First, you have to think about, oh, do I even know the people that I want to be able to ask access to? So what Access Analyzer does, it, it removes this upfront work of having users to write the specifications to say, ensure that Lee does not have access. In fact, it generates findings to tell you, hey, Lee has access. Did you intend for that to happen? And now it's flipped your notion because instead of you having to think and write about this, you're given this very declarative statement and you can say yes or no. And it captures your intent uh, into the specification and then you can use this tool. And the, the thing is, you can read how we did it. Like it's, it's, we use you know, techniques from predicate abstraction. And there was a talk yesterday by Andrew Gasick who, who presented this work. And you can you know, uh, read more about it in the paper. And these tools really resonate with customers who, who can leverage the power of verification without needing to be an expert in the area. And before I wrap up, I just want to provide you something that we are working on right now. And that is to say, how do we even synthesize permissions from the get-go? And this is an example application that operates on an S3 bucket, making a few API calls. And we do a data flow analysis to automatically extract the permissions needed by this application. And here, you can essentially get the right permissions to begin with. So the, the takeaway here is to make verification accessible to millions of AWS customers, you really have to think how can we extract infer specifications, which to them is their intent, and make it customizable to their use case and make it available uh, at scale where they don't have to think about what they're saying or asking, but it is integrated in their regular workflows. So if this is exciting, we're hiring for internships, full-time positions, and you know you want to have an impact, work with millions of AWS customers. You know, email us, uh, email me, email this uh, other email uh, on Cap 2020. So, at the there's also this this work I talked about, like how AWS is doing verification, but we have equally exciting work going on in Prime Video on how formal verification is being used. So I'm going to hand it over to Jim Christie, who's um, who manages a team in uh, London, UK, and we'll talk, tell you all about the work there. All right, thanks very much, Neha. I'm going to try and take over the screen. I do that. Take over. All right, perfect. Hopefully, you can see my screen. I'm just going to get into presentation mode. All right, cool. So, yeah, so my name is Jim Christie. Um, I'm, a, I'm a software development manager at Amazon. Uh, I've been in, in Prime Video for um, for just over eight years. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm not an applied scientist. So if you do have questions at the end, please make sure they're, they're easy. Um, so, yeah, so I, in the time that I've been at, at Amazon, I've managed uh, a few different kinds of teams. Um, I started out managing uh, back end service teams and then I moved over to manage a native client team. And now I'm managing a really different team, an automated reasoning team. Um, and my, my team's kind of unique in that it's it's got a fairly even split of, of software engineers and applied scientists. And so when we started the team, um, we decided that we we wanted to, you know, have software engineers collaborating with applied scientists to help them build, you know, production quality um, software that, that would cope with, with Amazon scale problems. Um, all right, so first, you know, what's what's Prime Video? Uh, so Prime Video is a, is a global streaming video service uh, and we offer, you know, subscriptions and uh, uh, um, uh, paid for on-demand content um, across the world. And our customers use a, a range of uh, a range of devices to get to us. So they use, you know, mobile devices, uh, they get to us via the website um, and they use what we call living room devices. Um, so these are things like uh, smart TVs, set-top boxes, consoles and, and streaming sticks. Um, all right, so Prime Video is, uh, is really focused on, on delivering high quality software. Um, uh, and we use a range, you know, a range of techniques. Um, so we use, you know, test suites. We use full CI/CD pipelines. We have device testing labs. Um, we have our own client UI testing frameworks that we've built ourselves. And and now, you know, after speaking to Byron Cook, we're now using static analysis as well. Um, and uh, and you know, we uh, we kind of decided that 
uh, it would be great to be able to improve quality without having to write more tests. Now, don't get me wrong, you know, I'm not saying that there's, uh, that there's, that there's anything wrong with tests. We, we, we really do value tests, um, but we also recognize that they're, they're quite expensive. Um, so this is a this picture on the screen now is a, is is the test pyramid, and some of you might have seen this before. Um, and the, the basic idea is that you know you should put a lot of your investment into into unit tests because they're they're fairly cheap to write and they're they're fairly easy to maintain. And then you should have a healthy chunk of integration tests, and they're a little bit harder to do. They're a little bit more brittle, harder to maintain, a little bit more expensive. And then at the top of the pyramid, you have manual tests. These are really expensive. You know, you need a person to actually run the tests and click on buttons and they can take a long time and they can really slow releases down. Um, so we, we try and avoid those at, at all costs. Um, but with, with static analysis, what we wanted to do was to, uh, was to, was to take this goal of compressing the test pyramid um, and complement traditional testing. And, uh, and, you know, our, our sort of main aim with it is to, is to automatically catch issues before they hit production. All right, so I wanted to show you a, a very simplified view of, of the Prime Video software stack. Um, so what we've got here at the bottom is, is the customer's home. And in the customer's home, they have a fancy TV or a console. Um, and on that device is, is our native UI rendering and playback framework. Um, and this is responsible for things like storage and crypto and DRM um, uh, rendering and, and playback initialization. So when the Prime Video app starts, uh, what it does is it pulls down the latest JavaScript client um, from, from the Amazon cloud. And that then starts communicating over the public internet with the orchestration layer and the backend services and marshalling and proxying all sorts of different um, uh, requests for content and, and, and UI layouts and things like that. Uh, all right, so that's a little little overview of our stack. And then so some of the challenges that we face, uh, you know, delivering our app to millions of customers are, you know, the, the native rendering framework is very hard to update. It ships with the devices from third party manufacturers to the stores. Um, and, you know, to put an update out to the native client sometimes involves us negotiating with a with a third party device manufacturer. Um, so you know, this is really mission critical code. We don't have the option to just roll it back. It's not like a, a back end service. Um, we also have, you know, our app is now on thousands of different unique device types. Um, and it's not just hard, it's, it's impossible for us to, to manually test that every change works with every device. It's just not possible. Um, we have hundreds of software engineering teams just in Prime Video, and we have, you know, kind of over a thousand software engineers, and they're all effectively working on the same product. Um, now, these teams have done a great job of, of, of kind of creating architectural boundaries. Um, but when one team makes a, makes a change that another team doesn't expect, it can result in a bad customer experience. And of course, at the forefront of our minds, and I've got it in bold, is, you know, we want to keep our millions of customers happy. Um, all right, so how do we do that? So, you know, Amazon's, Amazon's overall goal is to be Earth's most customer-centric company. Um, and, you know, what we do, you know, we like to um, to help us sort of focus on building the right things. We have this mechanism called working backwards. Um, and the idea is that to start building solutions, we, we really need to make sure we're solving a real problem. Um, and we do that by actually trying to speak to our customers or get into our customers' mindset. Um, and for my team, you know, we're really lucky because our customers are other software engineers and we can just go and sit at their desks and ask them questions. Um, so that's what we do. And that's what we did when we started the team. We went and identified some, some real problems that our, um, our engineers were facing. Um, so once we've kind of defined a, a solution, we can ask the customer for feedback. You know, does it really solve their problem? Um, then, of course, we can, it gives us the confidence to then go and design, develop, deploy um, software that, that, that fits the bill that we can then track, measure, and improve over time. All right, so what is the problem we're solving? Um, so there's a couple. Uh, but overall, you know, we're trying to maintain this really high quality bar for our software so that we can keep our end customers happy and prevent them having bad experiences. Um, so static analysis is, is great at catching bugs, which is really hard to write tests for. Um, but it's actually very hard to mechanize static analysis. Um, it's hard to get teams to, to fix backlogs of issues. Um, you know, they're really busy, they've got big roadmaps, they've got lots of things to deliver, um, and it's just really hard for them to prioritize uh, fixing code, um, uh, fixing problems in the code, which has probably been in the code base for a long time. 
Um, so, you know, we, we think there's uh, we think there's various sweet spots within the, the developer workflow, um, starting with uh, local command line tools um, and then in code review analysis and then in the CD pipeline quality gates. Um, and so my team decided to start with the code review as our sweet spot. Um, and so we built an automated code review bot called Bugbear. And what Bugbear does is it listens out for um, customer code base changes, listens for code reviews, and then it pulls the code and builds it and sends it off to Facebook's awesome Infer. Um, and, and when we get the analysis results back from Infer, uh, we chop it up, compare it with the diff, and post it back to the to the code review as comments to say, hey, you know, hey, here's a here's a race condition or here's a here's a null pointer exception. Uh, and this works really well because the developer has the context. They're incentivized to fix the bug before it gets pushed out to production. Um, and you know, we chose we chose Infer because it's really easy to use. It's easy to integrate with, and it and it biases towards less noisy results, which equals less angry engineers, um, which equals more bugs get fixed. Um, so we're not just we're not just using facebook's infer we're also building our own custom analyzers um so we built our own product called coast guard so this is what the applied scientists of the, in the team have been have been busy with um and and coast guards kind of looking at um so coast guards already also run by bugbear and also listens out for code reviews but it's looking for different things it's not looking for null pointers it's looking for um you know results that are, that are very specific to prime video code so um, we're looking for integration uh, bugs between different architectural boundaries. Um, so there's there's these critical points in the stack where these teams integrate with each other. And so we built our own analyzer to reason about that integration in the different layers of the stack. Uh, so we, we decided to start out with our mission critical code, which I introduced you to before. Um, and and the, the view that I showed you before isn't quite the whole story. So we have this native UI rendering and, and playback framework. Um, and to get it onto third party devices requires third party assistance. Um, sometimes we do this uh, within within Prime Video, but mostly we, we work with third party manufacturers to, to integrate our app with their, with their devices OS. Um, so we have a bunch of instructions that get passed between the device's OS and, and the Prime Video client. Um, and they, they need to be in the correct order. They need to be, um, you know, they need to be sequenced correctly. And sometimes they can be long running. And that would be really hard to test. So we decided this was a perfect use case uh, for static analysis. Um, so this is the bit that we're, that we're reasoning about. Um, and, and, you know, so, so it allows us to, to tell developers whether they got the sequence right. Um, and we call these sequences contracts because we're really kind of enforcing API contracts with this, with this, with these results. Um, and so right now in this layer, we have nine different contracts that we check when third parties are, are integrating with our app. Um, and so, uh, so for example, we, we do things like we check that global variables aren't being tampered with. Um, you know, if, a, uh, if a, a language or a locale or a time zone gets changed and a comma gets introduced somewhere, well, you know, the bad kind of things that can happen when, when those uh, unexpected uh, nuances uh, change. Um, we also look at things like uh, callback functions being implemented correctly, which is it's hard to write a unit or an integration test for. So Coast Guard helps us accelerate the integration process. It helps third party teams. It helps us get our app on more devices quicker and, and at higher quality. Uh, all right, so uh, what's next? What's next for Coast Guard and, and Bugbear? Well, for, for Coast Guard, we're, we're extending it to make more checks across more areas of the stack. There's all these hundreds of teams have all these integration points with uh, with critical dependencies on each other. Um, and we want to we want to um, leverage this reasoning uh, all over the place. And we're also beginning to empower uh, developers to write their own contracts um, so they can they can reason about things. They understand the code better than we do. Um, so that's going to be a, a, a huge, huge piece of impact for us to have. Um, and then as for Bugbear, well, uh, so we're going to be adding more analyzers, um, not just off the shelf ones, but building our own custom analyzers. And so, yeah, so here's a, here's a call to action. So if you're uh, maybe you're developing an analyzer, uh, that we could integrate with, you know, we'd definitely be interested in in hearing about your analyzer and if it can help us, um, you know, keep raising the quality bar. We really do feel like this is the the tip of the iceberg uh, for the amount of impact we can have using these kind of techniques at, at Prime Video. Um, I'm not sure if I've got time for questions. I probably ran over a little bit. Um, 
but if anybody has any questions or has, has posted any in the chat, I can't see the chat, so I'm going to end. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we'll uh, also have, you know, at the end of the session, if folks want to ha yeah. ask questions to any of the speakers, um, uh, you know, please. And even uh, just another reminder for people who may have joined late, uh, feel, feel free to type in questions uh, and some of the people who are not speaking, we can feel them or we can wait for the speaker at the end. So thanks, Jim, that was, uh, that was great. And um, moving up the stack a little, just uh, we, we also have another code analysis talk uh, by Lee Pike who's a principal scientist in uh, Code Guru, and he's going to talk about how they're using machine learning and program analysis um, together. Great. Thanks, Neha. Um, can you hear me and see my slides? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm a member of the Code Guru team. And what I want to, uh, oh, let me, oh, yeah. What I want to do is, uh, first of all, tell you about um, our vision for bringing machine learning and automated reasoning to the DevOps lifecycle. So, you know, we're all uh, fairly familiar with uh, this, uh, how we develop applications and write code. So, you know, you write code, you, uh, you submit um, code reviews, we build and test, we deploy the code, then you measure it, you instrument it, make sure that the performance is what you expect. And hopefully this uh, results in a virtuous circle uh, where we keep improving the application. Now, uh, it's easy for me to write this workflow on a slide, of course, but this is really difficult in practice to get this right. So um, it requires both uh, deep expertise uh, all along here, as well as there's a lot of tedious work to do. So you want deep expertise to review your code, make sure that there's uh, no issues in there. Um, uh, instrumenting, monitoring your code can be um, quite tedious, but you also need those deep, that deep expertise to take uh, the results of that and understand where that, uh, how to improve the software based on that. So based on that, I want to talk um, about uh, two services that we have today to um, address these issues that bring machine learning and automated reasoning uh, to assist developers to provide that expertise and remove some of the tedium. So very briefly, let me mention CodeGuru Reviewer which um, uh, helps you automatically uh, find and improve uh, the performance of your code by finding uh, hotspots and helping you understand um, how to remediate them. And profilers uh, uh, built using machine learning uh, to help uh, uh, automatically uh, improve the code um, based on uh, this dynamic analysis. Um, however, what I want to spend my time uh, focusing on, though, is CodeGuru Reviewer, which uh, operates at the beginning of this DevOps lifecycle. So this helps uh, find and remediate uh, issues in your code uh, at code review time. So um, everyone's familiar with this workflow. You make a code review, and you have a pull request, or uh, uh, and you have other members of your team um, look at your code and help you try to make sure you're following best practices, that there's no security issues, that um, you're using uh, the code correctly. And so you can think of uh, CodeGuru Reviewer as, as an automated additional reviewer um, that has been specially trained to find uh, hard to find issues. So it's been trained on uh, uh, millions of lines of Amazon code, open source code to uh, uh, find uh, specific code patterns and kinds of issues uh, that, uh, that, that developers might make and help you remediate them. Um, in particular, one thing we've really worked hard on is reducing the noise and false uh, uh, false positives. You don't want to wade through a haystack looking for a needle uh, in terms of findings. And so uh, both machine learning and applying that automated reasoning can help re it helps really reduce the number of uh, false positives so that the recommendations are actionable. And of course, this improves with developer feedback and uh, the breadth of the, the the recommendations that you get continues to uh, grow as as the um, the tool develops. So uh, today we support Java um, and support uh, Amazon Code Commit, GitHub, including GitHub Enterprise and Bitbucket uh, for uh, repos that you could associate with. So I just want to spend a few minutes just giving you a sense of some of the kinds of. Uh, 
uh, recommendations that Cougar Reviewer can provide today. So here's an example where a developer may be using a concurrent hash map. So suppose repo is a concurrent hash map. And in the second um, if statement, I'm going to ask if it contains a key IP, and if so, I get that key. And what can happen is uh, if this is uh, in a, a concurrent program, another thread may be modifying the map uh, after I check uh, that uh, the branch condition. And if so, I could have a deep, difficult um, bug that's hard to find because this only happens in a certain uh, certain instance when another thread's operating at the exact right point of my program. So these are the exact kind of things that are really hard uh, to, to debug that uh, Cougar Reviewer can help you with today. So an example in a different domain is sensitive information links. So here's a AWS API update job status, and it can take a, a number of parameters and uh, uh, update job status uh, uh, may uh, uh, result in an exception. So we're catching those and that's good. But one thing um, is that uh, one of our parameters is this uh, uh, the result of uh, get AWS account ID. And this is something that um, uh, may be sensitive and that customers um, don't want to uh, uh, log in, in, in when they're uh, catching an exception. And so Cougar Reviewer uh, can warn you about this and so that you can follow best practices in terms of uh, redacting uh, potentially sensitive information. So I've uh, given um, two examples for these first two categories, uh, but there are several other categories with numerous uh, recommendations that Cougar Reviewer provides um, as well. So including uh, best practices across AWS APIs, uh, ensuring that you are handling um, your resources correctly, that you don't have resource leaks, uh, finding other uh, code defects um, that you uh, may have, uh, help with refactoring, so helping find similar lines of code across your code base uh, it, to um, uh, clean up your code, as well as input validation. And uh, not only is the number of recommendations growing, but also the, the kinds of categories that we check. So um, just to give you a concrete example, here's a what a recommendation might look like in Bitbucket. So uh, you can see that a recommendation is is just like you would see from um, your other colleagues who are reviewing your code. Um, it provides, uh, it shows you exactly where the issue is, um, try, explains um, how to remediate it, and provides um, additional uh, information uh, to uh, help help improve uh, code in the future and help developers understand um, uh, the, the, the issue uh, behind the, the specific uh, code quality uh, finding. All right, um, and that's it. So uh, uh, Cougar is available today. You can uh, get started at this website. Uh, I'd love to hear uh, feedback from folks and feel free to send any questions my way. All right, thank you very much. Awesome, um, thank you, Lee. Uh, we we are a little ahead of schedule, so if anybody wants to join or like type in a question or turn on their audio and ask a question, um, we can, um, we can take one. Okay, so. Everyone's saving themselves for the Q&A afterwards. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we, if somebody comes up with a question in the meantime, they can, but uh, the, I, um, Nathan Chong is next. We're going back back down in the bits, bits of the bowel of um, everything. <laughs> And yeah. um, so Nathan is our uh, is also a principal scientist. He's working on um, proving mem memory safety, thread safety for uh, low level uh, code. And he's going to talk talk to us about his experiences and applying it to IoT and other applications. So take it away, Nathan. Hey, thanks, Neha. And hello, Cav. It's a privilege to tell you about how we're applying separation logic to the FreeRTOS kernel. So what is FreeRTOS? It may surprise you to learn that even if you're unfamiliar with the project, you may still have interacted with it. Here are some fun examples, both products containing FreeRTOS inside. So you see, on the left in this smart plug, FreeRTOS may have made you some coffee, or in this oven, baked you some fish. 
And that's because FreeRTOS is a real-time operating system for microcontrollers, which in another way of putting it is to say that FreeRTOS is an ideal building block for devices in the Internet of Things or the IoT. And this, of course, is where we're trying to disperse computation as widely and as finely as possible so that we can begin to sense and actuate the world at large. And although the examples that I gave were all in the consumer domain, the vision for the IoT is vast. Uh, there's a great talk at AWS reInvent 2019 where uh, Volkswagen speak about how the IoT is fundamentally transforming how they're building cars. And that's really why it's so exciting to be uh, applying automated reasoning to FreeRTOS, because this is an incredibly widely used code base um, with the potential to be deployed to uh, billions of devices. So this is a block diagram of a fairly typical IoT stack. Hardware is at the bottom, and the application-specific logic is at the top. These are going to differ dependent on the domain of your IoT device. FreeRTOS is the set of common functionality in the middle, and it's both the um, portable abstraction layer of the kernel and a set of common features for functionality like network connectivity. So I'm focusing just on the kernel, but this is just one of many pieces of automated reasoning that we're doing with FreeRTOS. And if you'd like to hear about those, I really encourage you to reach out in the chat to ask about those. All right, then. So let's zoom into this kernel then and talk about the um, primary data structure that can be used for inter-task communication, which allows for sending and receiving of data between different tasks. And this is the kernel queue that you see here. And interestingly, this has to work in a concurrent setting, meaning that we can have multiple writers, multiple readers, arbitrarily sending and receiving, and that these operations can overlap in time. So there are many interesting aspects to this data structure, but let me highlight one, which is uh, this concurrent setting with tasks, which are entirely standard to the C consistency model, but also interrupt service routines, or ISRs. These are pieces of code that run in an event-driven manner when some hardware interrupt occurs. A good example of an interrupt would be the wake word of an IoT device, and ISRs can themselves interact with the queue. And that's interesting from our point of view because tasks and ISRs are asymmetric in their power. You see, there are things that tasks can do, for example, block, that an ISR must not. And so from a specification point of view, we need to be able to adequately deal with both of these types of um, user. So we're talking about 700 lines of C code being designed for these microcontroller resource-constrained environments, where we may only have a few hundred kilobytes of memory. And this means that we won't necessarily have features which you would expect in microprocessors. Uh, virtual memory address spacing, for example, isn't normal in microcontroller environments. By low-level coarse grain concurrency, I mean that these mechanisms are really close to the machine. So, for example, the main mechanism that we're going to acquire a global lock on the queue is to turn off interrupts. On the other hand, our requirements for what we prove about the um, kernel queue are quite deep. We want to have memory safety, we want to have thread safety, and we want to have functional correctness. And we want this over the code of the implementation, not just the model. So separation logic's a great fit for this because fundamentally we're reasoning about resources and ownership. And then within the space of tooling available to us, we want to explore the more automated end. Verifast is such a tool. It's from Bart Jacobs and his colleagues at KU Leuven. And it's a deductive verifier for separation logic built using symbolic execution. Verifast has been applied to a number of really interesting industry projects, including Java card programs and Linux device drivers. So we were really keen to try it out too. And I think it's time that we took a look at some code together. So let me first point out that FreeRTOS is developed under an MIT license and freely available on GitHub. The same is true for the proofs that I'm going to show you. Let me show you that um, Verifast absolutely lives up to its name. Here we're going to run a proof regression over those 700 lines of implementation, 20 functions in total. We're going to be checking memory safety, thread safety, and functional correctness in about four seconds. If 
Finally, let's peel back the layer one more level and look at a proof in a little more detail, just to give you an essence of what it looks like. This is the uh, Verifast IDE, and the green bar at the top shows that the proof was successful. The proof itself is for an internal function to the Q API, and it's called by the send operation when we want to put the contents of uh, this buffer here into this queue. And ultimately, if we scroll down in the implementation, we see that this is done in the implementation as a mem copy call. So we see in the um, function contract, in particular in the precondition, the separating conjunction of separation logic is uh, essential to ensure that the source and the destination of that mem copy are disjoint. In other words, ensuring that the mem copy is well defined. Moreover, we are able to express in Verifast user provided predicates. And this is a shape predicate that captures the well formedness of the queue. And in particular, it allows us to lift the concrete implementation of the queue into its abstract representation, the logical, um, the logical list of elements inside the queue. This is best seen inside the post condition here, where after appending to the back of the queue, we see that the resulting data structure, its logical representation is the original contents of the queue, abs, plus this new element, x, where x is indeed the symbolic contents of that buffer that we wanted to enqueue in the first place. So I hope this gives you a flavor of what it's like to work inside Verifast. And I'll add that this speed that we saw in the um, proof time was really valuable when we were developing the proofs for having rapid feedback. Let me finish with a quote from Richard Barry. He's the founder of the Free Artos project and a senior principal here at Amazon. And I asked him to comment on the work to apply separation logic and all the other pieces of automated reasoning that we're doing too. And he said, quote, Demonstrating due diligence through the use of these state-of-the-art best practices is essential to maintain the confidence and trust of our user base. And uh, well, I just love this quote because uh, any world in which separation logic is starting to be seen as uh, best practice is a really great one indeed. And I think in no small part to the work inside this community. So uh, on that very positive note, I'll leave you there. Thank you. Awesome. Any questions? I'll have a look in the chat and follow up. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, you know, very exciting, you know, touching all parts of our life, whether we know it or not. Um, coming on to the next one, uh, some of you may know the speaker. His name is Daniel Croning. He's, he's attached to CAV in some ways, more than one. Um, I'm told, but um, it's um, he, he recently joined Amazon as a um, as a full time employee. So we are very lucky to have him and actually talk about uh, some of his work. So welcome, Daniel. Thank you very much, ma'am. So um, what you've seen is me presenting work on how to use machine learning techniques in order to verify software. Okay, so. The idea there is that we improve what we are doing um, to uh, deliver our usual targets, which is to verify hardware, software, and similar things uh, by means of machine learning. So I'm going to flip it around. And what I'm going to explain to you how the things we already know, so meaning the techniques we have been using um, in, in the last 30, 40 years or so, will help us to improve machine learning. Uh, just for a bit of context here, um, one of the things I've done was in my career was a postdoc with Ed Clark at Cunningham Mellon University. Okay? And Ed Clark was always extremely welcoming of customers, of verification and model checking in particular. So anyone who came and said, like, I heard you're, you're doing this temporal logic model checking business, and it could be useful for my application. His first answer, even before I heard what the application was, was yes. Okay, 
And he was always very welcoming of anyone who wanted to use verification for more or less any purpose. Um, this worked out in some cases extremely well. So a very, very high profile example is hardware verification. And it's, it's absolutely fair to say that any hardware engineer anywhere on the planet that builds circuitry will have heard of, of formal verification and, and model checking. And you, you can go into any semiconductor company um, and ask them um, how they assure correctness of, of a circuitry. And the, the answer will very often involve um, off-the-shelf formal verification tools, model checkers that they, in essence, buy from the EDA industry. Okay? Uh, so this, this story did go on. So we have Byron on the call, and he can tell you a lot how um, the progression of the adoption of, of uh, software analyzers um, happened in places such as Microsoft and in, in many, many other companies. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, we are not yet um, at a point where we can credibly say that each and every software engineer on the planet will necessarily assume that model checking is a tool that are used on a daily basis, okay? Uh, but there's certainly been quite some progress. So verification has over the years engaged with many other areas. Uh, so I would say that in security, um, verification technology is something which is certainly acknowledged to be something that's useful to prevent um, exploitable security vulnerabilities. Uh, but there have been also other um, interactions with, with many, many research areas, for instance, biology or um, so very recent applications, for instance, include, for instance, the, the analysis of legal text and, and whatnot. My view is that um, machine learning is one of these applications. So it's somebody who wants to know something about their design, okay, with various goals in mind. So very uh, for a common goal is um, that you feel that you might have to improve it or you, that you want some reassurance that it does what you intended, okay? So what I'm looking at is whether we can explain what trained components are doing and whether we can get assurances about them. And perhaps we can find one of the other bug that will then let us eventually fix it. So the key thing I'm interested in is how to do that at scale. So size matters here. So we have seen early work in our community where we have turned neural networks into SMT formulas. This is entirely feasible and something relatively straightforward to do with translation. Um, a neuron in a neural network is in essence um, an if, okay? So it's an IT expression in, in, in SMT lib. Um, and then you would have a, a, a linear expression followed afterward. So uh, we have done that, and it, it didn't scale to a level. Are you your slides supposed to be advancing? Uh, not quite yet. I will get there. Okay. Um, I will get there. So back to the point of scale, OK? So a neural network of realistic proportion will have a million neurons, possibly two or three million neurons, okay? Whereas the capacity where we're currently at with our formal reasoning techniques might be in the order of a couple of hundred. So there's a big, big, big gap in terms of what, uh, where we need to be at and what we can currently do, okay? Um, furthermore, a lot of the traditional QA processes that the software industry has adopted in the past 50 years or so don't work terribly well for trained components. And what I'm referring to here is in model checking, but testing processes. Let's say um, the, the QA stack that um, Jim has mentioned earlier. Okay. So if you apply this to a trained component, it doesn't quite provide you with the same level of reassurance that you normally get from uh, using this sort of technologies. And among all trained components, uh, deep neural networks are particularly problematic and difficult to deal with. Uh, in particular, behavior of these sort of components may be surprisingly frail. So this means it has worked for you many, many times when you looked at it and you turn around, okay, you turn your back um, to a computer and then it starts failing and misbehaving and doing things that you didn't quite expect to do. Um, the usual answer in the community to that problem is do validation. So this means collect a lot of data uh, where you know the answer, okay? Um, then you're not supposed to use that data to train, but what you're supposed to do with that data is to um, uh, 
check if the oh, oh well uh, check if the if the software that that you're building um, would deliver the expected answers on that validation data set. Okay, so uh, how can we help? Okay, as as the community that that is used to building verification technology. Um, I'm just going to um, give you pointers or teasers rather to a pieces of work that, that um, has been published in this area. Uh, so this is about the idea of using a trained neural network to produce test inputs, okay? Uh, specifically adversarial inputs. This means these are inputs which would trigger um, a neural network to deliver a wrong um, classification or labeling, uh, whatever you want to, to have it. So basically just giving you some, some flash images here. What we have on the left is an image which is correctly classified, in this case as the Alps, and on the right-hand side, it's, it's classified as a bison, okay? Um, down here, what we have is a sea snake, which turns into crossword. So I should stress that all of these inputs have been generated automatically by um, tooling that's obviously designed in order to, to uh, produce inputs of this case, yeah? Uh, so on the right hand side, we have more technology. So we, we turn the robin the bird into a keyboard. Um, so again, these images are generated. Yeah? Um, here's another uh, piece of work which is going to be presented at ECCV, which is a vision conference. Um, now, suppose you have uh, a neural network that in this case performs classification. Um, how can you tell what it really does, okay? So I'm now considering the case where um, the neural network delivers the expected answer. So you might be uh, under the impression that it's doing just the right job, okay? Um, so what we see here is a dog, the dog got labeled as a dog, so everything is all right. But why is it a dog, okay? And what this technology that I'm showcasing here is doing is it will give you a minimalist reason as to why it's a dog. So. Um, a reason in this case is a subset of the input. So everything that's um, in gray here has been masked out. And the remainder of the pictures, in this case, the, the head of a dog still gets classified as a dog by the neural network. Okay. So in this case, this worked out reasonably well. And we would say, well, you know, the reason why this picture is a dog is because of this part here. Okay. We might have been happy with maybe some lower parts as well, but definitely would have been unhappy if it used this, this toy here. Um, as a reason why it's a dog. But then on the other hand, look at this image here. So yes, it's correct in the sense that uh, the boy is wearing a cowboy hat. So the classification isn't wrong. So it will pass your validation. But the reason that the neural network uses to classify it as a cowboy hat is maybe not what we would intuitively expect. So what we see is that this sub part of the image here, which is clearly the boy's face and has nothing to do with the cowboy hat, um, is the key reason why the neural network side of it this is the cowboy hat indeed. Okay, and that clearly points to um, a, a problem with either the setup of the training or uh, the data set that you've been using. In any case, it's something that needs to be fixed. Okay. Um, so here we have some um, data, and one of the things I wanted to just point out is, is the timeline here. So these are competing tools that use other kinds of technology. Um, so what is interesting is the, the progression in that field. So what we see here is the um, size of the explanation. So meaning how many of the pixels do you have to put into the uh, subset of the image before the neural network will classify your image in the right label. So obviously this has a point here where if you give it the entire image, it will definitely classify it the way it does, okay? And there's a point down here where if you give give it nothing, it would be highly surprising if it gave the right gave the right text, um, classification. And then there's something in between. Okay, so uh, as you grow your explanation, as you grow the subset of the image, you would you would expect to see more and more correct explanations. So uh, SHAP was a tool that was pioneering in this area, and as you can see, um, you you need to give it a pretty large uh, part of the image before it produces. Um, not even half of the um, of the labels correctly for your uh, data set. So we are really nearly approaching 100% here. Um, the tool that uh, produced the explanation that you have just seen is called Deep Cover. So that's the blue line here, uh, as in Oxford blue, of course, okay? 
And as you can see, with, with a relatively modest uh, fragment of the image, so something like a third or so, uh, you, you get a very large number of the images um, classified in the way you would expect. Uh, so what I did want to point out is there were a couple of other tools, RISE, GradCam, Lime, and so on, Extremal, who have been published very, very recently in the last uh, six months to a year or so. And as you can see, these are getting closer and closer to the performance of deep cover. So that's massive and very rapid progress in this area of research. Um, so just to give you an idea of what sort of the difference could be between tools or algorithms, uh, so what you see here is a number of samples taken from the uh, classifier. So n is, is uh, the number of times you create a renal network. Um, and then you see the resulting um, explanation being given. Um, so on the right-hand side, you have RISE, which is one of the competing tools. On the left-hand side, you have Deep Copper. On the very left, you have the original image. So one cool thing about doing research around image classifiers that you, is, is that you get to use uh, cute uh, images of puppies and kittens and such things. Okay. Uh, so what we can see here is that for, for 2,000 samples, we get a fairly decent explanation. Uh, for 200, which is very, very small amount of compute use, uh, we still get a pretty decent um, explanation of what's going on. Uh, on the other hand, if we, if we let RISE only have 200 samples, when you can see it starts using pieces of the grass and so on, that's the explanation, which is really not correct. Okay. Um, so I will end things here with just a bit of advertisement. So these are the references to our work that I've just uh, mentioned and also to, to others. So, so you can also look at neural networks that control an agent, for instance. Uh, so meaning they evolve a system over time. Uh, so we've looked at work where we asked the question whether such trained agents would satisfy LTL properties um, and how would you do that effectively with, with uh, acceptable amounts of compute. We've also looked at the question whether giving specifications in terms of logic would let you train better agents, so meaning produce, uh, for instance, a multi-headed neural network, um, which splits faces of the job that needs to be done, um, and, and, very, and, and similar things. Uh, so I'm very happy to, to send pointers to, to further work in this area if anyone has questions about it. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, well, as as usual, you know, fire away questions for Danielle in the in the chime chat, and uh, um, we are a little ahead of schedule, but like we'll we'll keep going, we'll keep powering through. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Byron Cook, um, who started the automated reasoning group uh, about five years ago at Amazon, and uh, um, he's going to talk about some of the exciting new things that he's working on himself um he, he's he's um has been in his uh like i'll say basement even though he's technically on like the second floor it's just it's a it's a more powerful image he's been in his basement hacking away and so i'll yield the floor to him for him to tell us about it yeah awesome can you see my screen and can you hear me yes we can hear you now Good. Awesome. So this is my name. I'm Byron. Here's my email address, Byron at Amazon. It's pretty easy to remember. So, uh, so here are some tools we know and love. Uh, perhaps you've used them. Um, and the thing about these tools, and basically all of the tools that we use in our community, uh, is that they're built with the assumption that you're running on a single computer. They're typically built by someone who ran them on a laptop, and they ran them very effectively, and they have deep understanding of the tool, or, or the tools have made a bunch of decisions based on the assumption that they're running on a single computer. Uh, and so, for example, if we look at SVComp and look at the environment in which uh, contestants are competing, we're limited to eight processing units of CPU. And so the, the question emerges today is like, like, why do we have this limitation, right? Because the thing is like, aside from the formal methods community, everyone else has moved to massively distributed systems. So the entire world, if you look at all of the uh, customers of cloud, uh, they're, they're running massive uh, distributed systems across thousands, uh, tens of thousands of computers. So there's a, for example, on AWS, we have a, a global and exponentially growing amount of compute resources available in the cloud. Currently, there's 24 regions. There's three new regions that have been announced. And, and then in each region of the world, there's multiple what they call availability zones. 
Uh, so there's 77 availability zones currently worldwide. And this is, this is a uh, slide, uh, I, I mentioned this in my uh, Flock plenary talk uh, two years ago, but it's, it's worth mentioning because it, it's a, it sort of it gives some idea of the scale. So in 2015, AWS, that's uh, Amazon's uh, cloud offering, uh, added enough capacity every day to run all of the Amazon.com in 2005. So that's enough new computers to run a Fortune 500 company every day, and that was in 2015. And what we've seen since 2015 is continued exponential growth. So every year, essentially, AWS has grown 50% year over year. So you could take this number and uh, and then take 50% year over year over uh, the, the, the next five years to sort of work out uh, some idea of how much computers, how many computers we're adding every day uh, into AWS. So we have compute and we have databases and we have storage, for example, and all of these are distributed compute and storage services for, for various performance character, char characteristics you need. So for example, if you need state, you would, uh, one, of the, one of the good services for very fast distributed eventually consistent uh, uh, state is DynamoDB. Um, another example would be queue. So SQS called the simple queue service. Uh, is a is a queue API that's distributed and eventually consistent. And then we have both serverless and server-based computation. So if you want a thousand Linux machines in the sky, you use EC2. And if you just want to pass code to a service and you have and you have no idea how it's operating that or on exactly what kind of computer it's operating on it, then you'd use Lambda, for example. So so the question that uh, has been emerging in my head uh, over the, uh, since joining Amazon is like, why would you write uh, proof search programs for this, com this computer, a laptop, when you could write programs for this computer, right? This is a big computer that we can program, right? So we can have distributed algorithms looking for a single proof over thousands of computers and, 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 our, and, our, and we can find an eventually consistent uh, invariants or eventually consistent proofs over for our first single problem. And one of the charming aspects of mathematical proof is it's only the final argument that really matters, right? You can do complete voodoo uh, along the way and, and add case splits as you like. Uh, you, could, you could base your reasoning based on flawed assumptions, but so long as in the SAT solver, you eventually find uh, a, a proof that, that, that holds by the, by the proof system in the SAT solver, or in a symbolic model checker, if you find a, an inductive invariant, right, that could be the representation of the BDD, the interpolants you find, what, what have you, then no matter how you got there, so long as ultimately you have uh, a proof, then you're done. And so you can uh, distribute that search over many machines, and they may be out of sync as they're doing uh, proof search, but so long as it converges eventually into a consistent inductive invariant, then then that's that's all you need. To, that's all you really need to care about. So the validity of induction or 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 the uh, SAT instances can be proved typically in linear time, very easily, independently, and actually in in, in parallel, uh, separately, right? So it's it, the act of finding a proof and checking a proof are really independent, and they can both they can both be done. Uh, in, a, in a massively distributed way. Uh, so, and then if you look at many of our symbolic algorithms, and, and I should I should point out that the concrete algorithms, like say concrete, like explicit state model checking, has has been making use of distributed systems and concurrency for for some while. But in the symbolic uh, uh, reasoning area, we're, we're we're quite behind. But actually. Many of these algorithms are sort of ready for distribution with, with, with a bit of work. So if we take, for example, uh, Ken's paper from Cavo 6, it's a, it's a, he's describing a, call, a tool called Impact, and this is sort of the uh, ultimate interpolation-based symbolic model checker. So, so what Ken does is he introduces, uh, here I have uh, from figure four of the paper, there's a few other operations, but basically uh, four operations that uh, you can execute in any order uh, to find an inductive invariant over the program, right? And so, uh, so we're 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 built in in this in Ken's paper. What he's doing is he's he's unfolding the control flow graph 
into a tree and then trying to limit the space of the, the, the growth of that, of that tree by finding back edges, which, which represent the uh, current candidate for an inductive invariant. And there's no reason that this needs to be executed on a sequential machine. In fact, there's no reason this needs to be executed on a machine. You can imagine many different machines all uh, editing this graph. And so long as we eventually find a consistent proof by induction, then, then we're done. So with a bit of care, we can call, expand, refine, and those cover steps, and, the, and there's a, a few other steps in Ken's paper, uh, on many machines in an eventually consistent graph, and, and, and now distribute, uh, distribute perhaps, perhaps in a, a you know, like you get speed ups that are linear with respect to the um, number of processors you use, who knows. Um, and so, so another really promising uh, result is, is I, don't know, I don't know if you're following the SAT competition, but there was a new track in the SAT competition this year uh, called the Cloud Track. And uh, the new cloud solver, so these are distributed, eventually consistent solvers, uh, are solving problems that none of the other solvers can solve. So there were 250 instances where no sequential solver could solve them in 300, uh, 3,000 seconds, but the cloud solvers, which, which, which distributed the proof search and set over many machines, were able to solve them. Um, so some questions going on my, in my head. What, what are the proof techniques that we need that take advantage of the world's largest and fastest growing computer? Right. So that, that's a question that's been uh, going through my head, and now I'm, I'm taking some time to try and to try and build that. What are the assumptions uh, that are no, perhaps no longer relevant? Maybe uh, lazy, for example, uh, the lazy loop, right? Where you uh, sort of counterexample guided abstraction refinement, or the the method of abstracting from theories to set. Maybe that sort of works really well on a unit processor or a single machine case, but maybe that doesn't uh, make as much sense in a, in a distributed model. Now, I'm not sure. Um, and so what if we were to take a clean sheet of paper called like an A4 and, and try again, but with in mind the A, we're, we're gonna, the construction of proof certificates is, is as a feature from day one, and also that we're going to always execute this on a distributed uh, global machine, right? And if those are the uh, constraints now, as opposed to we're going to run this really uh, on a, you know, Pentium microprocessor really fast, then there's really a different set of, of, um, of decisions we're probably going to make, and that's that's uh, something I'm working on now. And so I think I'm the last speaker. So uh, I'm now going to end my talk there. And I'm happy to take questions both about uh, this thing I've been talking about, but also I'd be happy to take questions about uh, formal reasoning at Amazon more generally. Thanks. Thank you, Byron. Thank you. Questions, comments?